Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Shout Online Conference. We are here at ShoutLearning.org, and we're glad to have all of you with us. We are ready for our third session today, which, by the way, we'll have a bonus update at the end on our tree bounding project, so don't go away for that either. We'll come and touch base with uh, Jess Parker and Josh Falk before we go. Um, also, just to kick things off, how about a little bit of music? Let's listen in. This forest was primeval, untouched, unseen. Trees fell. New trees sprang from fallen ancestors, reached with their thin tips through a colonnade of evergreens for a slit in the sky, and in time were reclaimed, as man is reclaimed by Mother Earth. Watch the purple martins as they wheel in the sun. Red winged blackbirds calling as the day. And that carrying into our program today is brought to you by Smithsonian Folkways. There's a lot, of, a lot of great music like that on the Smithsonian Folkways website. I thought it was a nice way of us getting back into our next session today, which is brought to you by the Smithsonian, Microsoft Partners in Learning, and Taking It Global. Don't forget, if you're joining us for the first time, there's closed captioning available to you, and you can follow the on-screen instructions using the C button if you wish to turn those off at any point. And we're also following along all of your posts on Twitter and Facebook, so don't forget to tag your, face, your Twitter posts with the hashtag ShoutLearn so we can keep track of your comments and try to integrate them into our discussion today. Also on hand with us is Chris from London, who is our illustrator today, and he is drawing in real time see a glimpse of his screen right now coming up on your screen. He has the title ready to go for Pat McGonigal, and he'll be adding to this uh, this drawing based on what you have to share with us as we go along today. So keep your comments flowing in the chat area on the left side of the screen. Thanks, Chris. And with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Pat McGonigal, who is an ecosystem ecologist at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, also known as CERC. And he's going to talk to us about how to inspire all of us and our students about the living, breathing, and changing nature of soils. Um, please join me in welcoming Pat. Hi, Pat. Hello. Hello, everybody. This is a lot of fun. I'm happy to have a chance to um, share my enthusiasm about soils with you and to um, talk a little bit about uh, what was really a life-altering experience for me, and that was the opportunity I had to um, actually serve as a curator of a uh, major exhibit dedicated to soils uh, that was developed for the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Uh, it was up for about a year and a half and uh, has been traveling a little bit since then. And uh, so I want to share with you a a few of the things that, um, that we did in order to bring soils to a, a typical museum audience, which uh, are, are usually sort of, uh, oh, middle school, high school aged people and, uh, and their parents. Um, and I, I thought I would actually uh, kick this off with a question uh, for you to, to just see where we where we, um, whether we all w would agree on, on this, do uh, you think most people find the topic of soils boring? What do you think, not, not you necessarily, but just your average person, you know, um, if asked, hey, do you want to go see a soil exhibit, you know, what would they say? And uh, I see the um, boats, the pole coming up here, and it's clear that... Uh, <laughs> That you know, we all agree it's not the it's not the world's sexiest topic, soils, and yet we wanted to uh, put together an exhibit that people would come visit, even though uh, right next door in a hall next door um, they could go see the Hope Diamond. So that's the sort of thing we were competing with. Um, we did some surveys. Well, you know. But before I talk about our survey, um, somebody sent this to me shortly after we started our exhibit project as, as evidence that um, most of you in the poll are correct. Soils are indeed boring. This is out of a kid's book, um, and, and this kid's idea of the most 
boring museum in the universe is an exhibit on soil. So there you go. That's what we were faced with. Um, we did some polling just to ask people what they thought, uh, what their reaction would be to an exhibit on soil. And we got things like, well, it'll be kind of boring. Maybe it'll have something to do with gardening. So here, here um, you know, this person and many other people think of soil only in the context of their garden or a farm. They don't think about soil other places generally. Um, the next person said, well, I'm not greatly excited. Maybe someone who works with geology or archaeology would be interested in that. So typically not your your broad cross-section of the public. <laughs> and then the third person said that uh, the exhibit made them think of Al Gore. Uh, they adore him, but the only problem is the interest factor. In other words, they think soils are, are adoring, but uh, not necessarily interesting. And so this is what we were faced with in designing an exhibit on soil. And frankly, this is what, um, this is what teachers are faced with no matter, you know, where they are. And I do agree with Michelle that, you know, it depends on the excitement that the presenter of the topic possesses for soils. That's true, Jennifer, but I, I might add that um, there's, you know, there's, um, th there's something else to consider here. And that is when, when we're teaching about soils, there's an inspiration gap. In other words, people might appreciate the fact that they're important, and they might appreciate the fact that there's a lot to know about soils, but they're not necessarily inspired by the topic. Um, they're not inspired by soils the way they are by a tropical rainforest or, you know, by polar bears. I mean, it just doesn't grab most people at that level, and that's what we wanted to try to change uh, in our exhibit. So, um, in our exhibit, uh, the first thing we did in order to try to inspire people about the topic is, uh, is to present, uh, to the extent we could, um, the fact that soils are beautiful aesthetic things. And so what you see here in this slide is um, a lot of uh, profiles of all sorts of different soils. And, uh, you know, you can see immediately that, first of all, they're incredibly diverse. They, you know, no soil profile um, necessarily looks like the next. Uh, they can often be colorful. They have interesting texture and patterns, the layers give them personality, and so at one level, uh, you know, you know, you could be standing on, on, you know, some very, a very beautiful soil profile, never know it, of course, unless you were to dig into it. Um, so, you know, we displayed soils. We actually had profiles of real soils from all 50 states and three territories, and lots of images of profiles like these shown here. Um, what we would uh, we we would certainly have um, liked to also um, allow people to touch soils. That's another way of experiencing soils, uh, but uh, that's just not possible in a, in a museum. But it is possible to do, you know, for a for a teacher, um, you know, just go outside and and let let the kids touch it. It 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 has texture, you can squeeze it, it, you can smell it. Um, what doesn't come up in this slide is another a w a way that we approach the aesthetics of soil, and that is um, by putting up quotes that have been written about soil. The author of, of this uh, book, Dirt, uh, William Brian Logan, wrote, how can I stand on the ground every day and not feel its power? How can I live my life stepping on this stuff and not wonder at it? And it's true. I mean, it, he, he puts it very, you know, very succinctly that you know, soil 
you know, is, is soils are powerful bodies, and and uh, there's actually been a lot of poetry and, and elegant words put to paper that can help inspire uh, kids about soils. And finally, uh, we chose a whole variety of images and built models of various kinds and produced videos that had people interacting with soils every day and, um, or in, and in many different ways, whether it's through sports or gardening or my favorite is the girl in the bottom right-hand corner who, um, you know, is playing in mud. And that kid was me at one time. So, um, so we, we tried. We tried to bring soils to people, you know, in ways that they may not be thinking about them if the context is, um, you know, is, is simply something like gardening, for example. Um, so. This is the uh, this is the the final thing I wanted to mention in the approach that we took to soils, teaching soils, which is that um, not not to harp on it too much, but rather than present soils in the context of agriculture, which is the context most people are exposed to soils uh, in, we took an ecosystem approach, and so we had a lot of examples of, of things that people do find inspiring, like tropical rainforests or cypress swamps or, you know, vast prairies with giraffes or even streams where, where people fish for trout or go wading. All of these systems, including the forest, the streams, and the grasslands and the wetlands, all of these systems spring from soils. And soils are part of them, and in fact, soils really, in a lot of ways, give birth to places on Earth that people find inspiring. Um, the ecosystem services part of this um, is that may be a, a term that you're not familiar with. Um, ecosystems actually do things for people, and we tried to uh, point out, you know, ways in which soils actually help people. And uh, to do that, we had um, some, we have interactive games, um, and here's one. So here's a question that, that you might have been asked or had a chance to answer in the exhibit. Why do rivers flow when it's not raining? Why do you suppose that happens? Now, I'm going to wait just for a moment to get your polling results. Okay, runoff, that's a good one. Always raining somewhere, that's true. Uh, or, you know, perhaps it's true. Okay, looks like we, uh, oh, oh, looks like water from soils and aquifers is starting to uh, pick up some ground there. And, in fact, that, that's the right answer. Um, Water, when it rains, water falling on soils that can percolate, soils that aren't covered with asphalt, for example, water can percolate down into the ground, flow down into the soil, and eventually into groundwater. And in the soil and the groundwater holds this water and then releases it slowly over time into streams and lakes, rivers. And, and, and so this recharge of water through soils is what keeps rivers full and the fish and such that are in the rivers um, alive. And so soils are intimately connected with water. If the soils are dirty, then so will the water be because the water's passed through it. If the soils are clean, the water passing through the soils and coming out in the drinking water reservoir will be clean. Um, now, you know, it's, you know, you do, in order to teach soils, there are some basic facts that, that you have to know, and this is, we dealt with this in the exhibit. Uh, this slide is one of those basic facts, which is that although 
you might, you know, a student might think of soil as that, as the solid stuff that they hold in their hands. Actually, the solid part of, of the soil is only about half, half of the soil's volume. If you, if you took out, you know, a, a, a square of soil, only about half of that's solid. And that solid part is the sand, the silt, the clay, and the plant organic matter that gives it the brown color mixed in. The other half is space. And that space can be filled either with water, which plants use, plants and microorganisms use, uh, or with air. And that air has oxygen in it, which plant and soil organ plants and soil organisms also use. So here's three different pies, and they're showing you that half of the pie is solid, and now I'm going to point here, uh, half the pie is solid, and this, in this particular slide, um, these parts are solid, okay, and uh, the other half has, has openings, in this case the openings are filled with water. And so the question is, what kind of an ecosystem would it be half solid and half filled with water? And let's see what you, let's see if, okay, 100% of you say wetland. <laughs> so that's right. You're very good. You're, you're very good. Okay. Now let's try another one. Let's try the one in the middle. Um, if you can see it, covered up in my case. You might have to move that, that, yeah. Okay, so the one in the middle, um, half of it's solid, but this open, but the open space, and I'm going to point to it here, is mostly air. There's hardly any water in there. And right, that's a desert. And then on the right side is, um, is a system that has a combinate, has sort of a, a combination of water and air. And that is a nice prairie soil or a farm soil. And uh, if we move that box out of the way, the polling box out of the way then, um, and this is available online, the, you know, the student can guess that, oh, okay, this one on the left was a peaty bog and, and there's our, our dead bog man mummy that I'm pointing to. Uh, the next one, is a desert, and the next one is a, uh, a fine mid Midwestern farm soil. Another topic about how soils, what soils are, is, uh, is about how they form. And this can be a deadly boring topic for a lot of people, but, um, but we addressed this with a, a video, an animated video that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, I, I thought about, well, we're going to show just a real quick clip of this uh, for you to get an idea of the video. Welcome to Soil Stadium, where the world's greatest soil chefs compete. Let's meet today's competitors. First, Pierre Leterre. Leterre is famous for his spectacular Wisconsin loam. I understand your soils are incredibly popular, chef. Popular? It is more than popular. It is Inspirational. Yes, Leterre will be hard to beat. But if anyone is up to the challenge, it's Sandy Marsh. She created many of the soils in the state of Washington. Sandy, you work a lot with volcanic ash. Oh yes, I just love volcanic ash. It speaks to me. Her work certainly is exciting, but is it a little too explosive? Chefs to the kitchen! So now, let's meet our judges from the forests of New England, that renowned reptile, Quincy Carapace. They'll have to move mountains to impress me. And all the way from the bogs of Canada, Mr. Methane himself, Gassy Gallagher. <laughs> and finally, please welcome the lovely hermit thrush, Sylvania. <laughs> and now, we are ready to reveal today's secret ingredient. Sand! Chefs, you have just 6,000 years to create a unique soil from sand. Bang!
Okay, so I stopped the video there, um, but you saw enough of it to see that rather than teach, rather than try to explain that soils are formed through the actions of organisms and climate and such, uh, you know, we took a more playful approach where, um, you know, we have these two soil chefs competing to make the best soil out of sand. One makes a bog, one makes a forest soil, and um, in the end, the judges give their opinion about it. Again, that's avail that uh, video is available online. Okay, um, the next slide then is just a list of the key messages that we were trying to emphasize, not by stating them, not by writing this down, but by um, weaving these ideas through the exhibit. Soils are living, breathing things. They're full of life and, you know, they take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide because of all the microorganisms and plants that live in them. Uh, they're incredibly varied. I made this point already. They, they, they look different and act different. They're, they're constantly changing. They respond to climate change. They respond to disturbance. They respond just to time. They age. They're important not just to the things happening on land, but to the air we breathe and the water we drink. And they can, they can recover from disturbance, but it's very difficult. So um, how did we address this issue of soils are alive? Well, we, we introduced we introduced microorganisms and um, that actually some of which you can only see with a microscope like this tiny bacteria here uh, and some of which you can actually see with the naked eye like this fungi. Um, another approach we took was um, a, and now this is, a, this is more like a six-minute video, which I won't show you the whole thing, but, um, you know, a, a video that is kind of a copy or, or inspired by um, a popular television show that we call Soil Science Investigations. And I'm going to show you two clips just to kind of give you a feel for, you know, the, the the way we approach the topic. So the first clip is just the opening of, of this um, crime movie that uh, is meant to just really grab people's attention more than anything else. So let's roll that one first. And don't forget, folks, Friday is Feed the Homeless Night. To help out, contact Monica Miller. Monica. Feels like I've been gone more than two weeks. I can't wait to get home and put my arms around Linus. Linus! I'm home! I really miss you, bud! About 42 inches. Victim is at least a hundred pounder, I'm guessing. Loamy soil, a lot of aeration, and reliable water. Smart grower. What you got, Olivia? Pulpy liquid. The lab will tell us how long it's been here. Soil. It's the greatest. Tells us how things grow, how things die. So, that, I just love that line, soil, how things grow and how things die. And it's true, soils do tell us about those things. 
Uh, so that's the introduction. And but 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 I want to show you a second clip that really I think um, is more important because it illustrates the way we used video uh, to help students visualize microscopic organisms, and that's really what I want to emphasize here is um, the the illustrations really of microscopic organisms. You know why we're in the forest, right? Sure. Well, the wheelbarrow carrying Linus got to the marsh. Some of the forest soil fell on the ground. Whoever took Linus might have left a clue here. What do you notice? I don't see a lot of dead plants like the marsh soil. Right. In upland forest soils, there's more oxygen and a whole world of critters that feed on dead plants and animals. Fallen leaves are colonized by microbes that feed on leaf tissue. The microbes become food for earthworms and other insects. Eventually, the tons of leaves and twigs that fall each year are reduced to a few tiny bits. Sounds like a feeding frenzy. Microbes eat dead plants, animals eat microbes, animals eat each other. I had no idea there was so much death and destruction in soil. Not just death, there's also lots of life. In a single square meter of garden soil, there are trillions of bacteria and fungi, billions of protozoa and nematodes, plus thousands of mites, springtails, insects, slugs and snails, not to mention a mammal or two. All in this tiny square? Yep, and it recycles nearly all the nutrients this forest needs to grow. Soils are the ultimate recycling bin. A circle of life. <sighs> Your circle of life just left poop on my shoe. Oh, let me see. Oh, it's gross. To you, but to soil, it's nitrogen for green leaves and phosphorus for root growth. Okay, okay, but help me get it off my shoe. So, okay. Okay, so, yeah, there's a... There's some great questions coming in, and is it possible to download these videos? Um, no, but you can show them. You know, you can project them off the web. And actually, if you want to contact me personally, I could try to I can try to get you copies of them. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, now a lot of the exhibit uh, was meant to try to um, show people, you know, where soils fit into their lives. And um, one way we did this, and I see that, and I see that uh, many of you have already been chatting about this uh, on the side, is is by showing people the everyday objects. That come from soil. And so uh, this is my next poll question for you. How many, there's six items listed here, how many of these items uh, come from soil? You can actually have people check all, all the ones they think come from soil. They can actually check the poll option here. Okay, that's that's good then. And so people, so I, clearly you recognize, many of you recognize that, you know, if you bring in a painting and show it to the students in your class, um, you can make the point that the, the pigments in the paint are often derived from soils even today. Um, pottery, of course, is made from clay, which soils um, are the source of. Anything that's cotton um, is, is, you know, directly harvested from soil, and wool is, you know, indirectly harvested from animals that eat plants that grow on soils. Um, the space shuttle in the United, that the United States uses to fly into space is protected from the heat of reentry by tiles that are made of ceramic harvested from soil, and anything from a guitar to the chair uh, you may be sitting in made of wood is a product of soil. And so 
you know, if you really start to think, every moment of every day we are, you know, we are in handling and encountering and interacting with the products of soils. So this 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 intimate um, kind of backyard connection is one that we made, and here you can see uh, one of the uh, a, a painting, a, a large surround painting. Um, in, in the exhibit where we made this point and others. So that's that's kind of at in the back at the backyard level, home level. Uh, but soils are also important as part of landscapes. In other words, um, when you when you look out over large landscapes out of a plain window or from a tall building, you're seeing many different types of soils uh, interacting with other each other, uh, soils eroded from the top of a hill are carried down and deposited um, and deposited into onto soils at the bottom of the hill. Um, and so uh, this is something that's very important to understand, particularly for a number of environmental reasons. And uh, in fact, we, we dealt with this issue um, specifically in a section called Soil Sense to the Planet, in which uh, we made the point that you know, we really have quite a challenge ahead of us as, you know, as the people who live on this planet because on the one hand, we are increasingly uh, dependent on soils for growing food, fiber, and now even fuel. Uh, and and the, the the number of people on the planet who need few food, fiber, and fuel is increasing by something like 80 million a year. So so the products from soil that we're going to need are just growing exponentially. Uh, on the other hand, the processes we use to extract these products from soils uh, is having an effect on the environment an increasingly large effect. And so in this pair of pictures, on the one hand, we need to um, grow food. On the other hand, here's an a aerial view of the Mississippi River uh, and its delta showing, I'm having trouble getting this to work, but showing um, sediment washing down the Mississippi River and spilling into the Gulf of Mexico uh, where it's causing, uh, which is causing problems uh, for fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico, and so this kind of large landscape perspective is one that's important um, to to environmental science in general. And finally, soils. We made the point that soils are important at a planet level. And uh, this is woven throughout the exhibit, but um, uh, here I've got a couple, a couple of questions that uh, were drawn from the exhibit related to this. So there's a setup where you know, we explain that soils store carbon as solid organic matter, partially dead, I mean completely dead and partially decomposing plants. And, and so by storing carbon, they keep the carbon out of the air in the form of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. Soils store carbon, keeping it out of the air. Uh, but, but trees store carbon as well in the form of wood. And so uh, the question uh, that I have uh, in this poll is how much carbon do do earth soils hold compared to all the trees on earth? About half as much carbon as you'd find in all the trees on earth, same amount, or much, much more. And I see, okay, we have four answers, five answers, seven, eight, and it looks like um, it's a landslide for much, much more, and that is the correct answer that there's actually 300% more, three times more carbon locked away in the earth's soils than there are in trees. And so 
Um, if you think that clear-cutting rainforest is bad to climate because it puts carbon dioxide into the air, well, disturbing soils has much the same effect. Uh, here's another quiz question for you that's meant to kind of uh, demonstrate global connections among soils. And here um, we explain that this squid that you see a picture of uh, gets its nutrients by eating zooplankton. Zooplankton get the nutrients from phytoplankton, but where do the phytoplankton get their nutrients? Of course, it's from the water, but where do those nutrients really come from? And uh, we have one person who answered tidal waves. Uh, there's a uh, few people, Asian dust. Let's see, nobody for Australia. Oh, Australian beaches, whale poop, one of my favorites. Uh, the correct answer is actually Asian dust. The most limiting nutrient in the Central Pacific Ocean is iron. And the iron that is there is brought there from the Gobi Desert. It's blown from desert soil through the atmosphere and deposited in the Central Pacific where it supports marine food webs. And so these are some surprising global connections that people, um, you know, students may not appreciate, particularly if they tend to think of soil simply as you know, something that they have in their backyard or in a garden. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to start to wrap up a little bit now just by pointing out that, the, that um, we knew the exhibit would last some small amount of time and be available to a fairly small number of people millions, but still small on a global scale, and um, put a great deal of effort into developing a website uh, where there's just a, trem a tremendous number of um, interactive tools that um, can be used by teachers anywhere uh, to help uh, engage kids about soil. and. Um, I thought now that I would uh, spend just a few minutes perhaps um, pointing out a few of these on the website. And Pat, uh, Pat I'm going to bring up a uh, an area here where you can start sharing your screen. You can go ahead and do that. Uh, if you can multitask, and I know you can, there's a good question here from a, a teacher in Queens, New York. Hello, Ms. Kafina, who wants to know, can you talk a little bit about composting? especially in urban areas, and how do we get compost going in schools where it might not be in most people's comfort zones? Well, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, that video that I just showed, the one um, that, that's called Soil Science Investigations, um, is it's about a pumpkin murder, <laughs> but the real point of it um, is composting. Um, when you, um, in, in the video, what we learn is that uh, by taking uh, old pumpkins or leaves or what have you and composting them, uh, you can put nutrients into the soil. And um, of course, nutrients are what plants need to grow well. Uh, so that video is a, is a nice way of introducing students to the idea that composting um, is a good way of providing plants the nutrients they need. One, one way to approach this is to say, is to explain to students that um, the compost has a lot of nutrients in it. And when you put, when you let microorganisms use the compost and, and break it down or decompose it, the microorganisms are actually recycling the nutrients out of the old leaves so that they can be used to grow new leaves and new wood and new roots. Great. That's a good question. If there's any other questions, I'd, I'm happy to uh, 
to answer those too. Great. So feel free to keep your questions coming in here on the left-hand side. And while Pat uh, switches over to give us a bit of a tour of some web-based resources, and uh, as soon as you bring that up on your screen, we should start to see it, Pat. Uh, I've, I'm also sharing uh, Chris, our illustrator's screen with you, so you can see how he's capturing our event about soil today. He's doing a great job there. Uh, okay, so let's see. So we just need you to move that window into your, I think, your other monitor, Pat. We, I just see the uh, desktop, the, the, the blue area. And then uh, hopefully we can see it. Okay, well, see, I need to make this small again. And uh, Ms. Kafina is asking for additional resources uh, related to composting. And we certainly welcome anyone in our online session who has uh, ideas to go ahead and uh, share those resources as well in the chat. Um, and Pat, if, you, if you'd like, you can go ahead and uh, just uh, tell us the URL, well, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share it if you'd like. Well, I'll, I think, uh, can you see it? Uh, yep, now we have it. You got it. So I'll bring it up here. Perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is the Digit website. And uh, this list on the left that I'm pointing to now, um, is a, is a list of our of our interactives. Uh, this one, Hidden Horizons, is a puzzle game where uh, students can can learn the the different layers of soil and what they mean, um, and and you know how they relate to one another. Of course, soil layers is how uh, people read the history of soils. Um, if uh, this is called Earth skin types, and um, it has you know the, the major types of soils. This particular type of soil is an organic wetland soil, and it shows you a map of where you find this type of soil, a picture of what the natural ecosystem they occur in or found or, you know look like, and then a profile. So it's a nice way of demonstrating. Um, the different uh, varieties of soils that one can find. This where in the world soil game is kind of fun because um, the idea is that you pick a soil and look at the different layers in it. Now here's a mammoth tusk. Um, here's a, a, a layer of frozen soil. And so I'm going to guess that this is permafrost, which it is. And, um, and then the idea is that you rise up out of the soil and find yourself um, someplace, in this case in, in Siberia, quite a way from ways from uh, Washington, D.C. or any other number of places around the world. That's a fun game. Um, there is a, a greenhouse, what we call the greenhouse gas calculator, in which the student can play farmer. And this farmer has to decide what type of crop to grow, whether or not to till the soil or not till the soil, um, and whether or not to add nitrogen to the soil or not. And um, in the end, depending on the choices, the student will find that um, he or she has grown a a large crop or a small crop, but they'll also find out whether the choices they made were good for the climate or or not. And um, and sometimes they'll get answers like, "Well, you've you've done great things for the climate, but you haven't made any money, and so you're out of business." <laughs> and so the game recognizes that there's a balance there. Um, kids love things that are close to home. And so in the, for the people in the U.S., this um, state soil interactive allows them to uh, pick a state. Um, I'm going to guess that we have somebody here from, say, Mississippi. When they click on Mississippi, a postcard comes up. There's a note on the back from Aunt Maud and Uncle Buster um, about their sightseeing tour where they – uh, came across white oaks dripping with Spanish moss that grow on Natchez soils. That's the Mississippi, official Mississippi state soil. 
and um, they can find here they can see maps of where the soil is, uh, an interpretation of a soil profile, um, NAPTES soil profile, you know, what makes it so special, what can you grow on it, what kinds of wildlife lives there, and, and then some fun facts. Um, that, that game, excerpts from, from the game we played are on here, and here's some of the videos I showed, Chef Challenge, um, uh, Get Soil Savvy, which is um, basically a video interpretation of disturbance that people cause to soils. It covers a lot of ground. And finally, they can come here if they want to meet, if they want to um, find out about careers in soil. Here's people with all sorts of careers in soil from TV hosts to professors to somebody who studies soils on Mars to um, somebody who, um, you know, well, to me, <laughs> all sorts of things. So anyway. And we put a direct link for those who want to go right to your page and learn about your career as a curator and soil ecologist there at CERC. Excellent. Thank you for, for that tour. There's nothing like a guided exploration of what are some great resources, so thank you very much. Um, we have an opportunity to ask any final questions. We already see here that we've got teachers who are going to be sharing this with their science teachers, their colleagues as well. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, we are very delighted to uh, see such great exchanges going on. Any, any final encouragement? Uh, Pat, for our for our participants. Well, um, yeah, my encouragement is to, uh, you know, first present students with, you know, things that that inspire them about about nature, and and go from there to explain that many of these things have connections to soils. Uh, and to take advantage not only of our website, but there's many, many other uh, resources out there. There's movies, a, a movie called Dirt. There's books and a lot, a lot of resources that I think can, um, you know, help bring richness to the topic. But then also, don't forget if you get a chance to actually go out and dig in some soil and touch it, smell it, and so forth. Uh, one question before we uh, turn to our tree banding update, and I do want to make sure everyone sticks around just for a very brief update from our uh, other team at CERC, Josh and Jess. Um, but uh, we, we have had a question that really relates to some of the student challenges that people will be working on, uh, and it's um, it, it relates to construction and soil and building on soil. Uh, anything in particular that you wanted to mention or resources that relate to building methods that still safeguard soils? Well, uh, the, um, a great resource is the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There you can find um, information about uh, what types of soils are good. For, well, you'll find out that some soils are good for some uses and not for other uses. One way to approach this is to um, think about septic systems. Some soils are really good for septic systems and others are poor. Uh, you can think about soils that are subject to um, landslides, obviously not real good for uh, building on. You can think about soils that uh, produce acid when you dig into them, and there's an example of that in the uh, Dig It website that I just showed. Great, and uh, we're taking a look at, at Chris's drawing. Uh, one more quick question that, that, that we have before we transition to a couple of quick things uh, that you might want to do after hearing Pat's session. Uh, the distinction between soil and dirt, what's the difference as we wrap up, and, and why does it matter? Well, uh, you know, actually, you could ask five soil scientists about the distinction and probably get at least three different answers. I'm going to give you the one that I like, which is that uh, soil 
soil is something, soil is in place. And by that I mean that um, if you were to dig into it, it has layers. The, the top is dark because of all the plant matter. Um, it has other layers that are rich in clay and layers that are, you know, more rich in sand. And the order of those layers, their characteristics and so forth, tell a great deal about the soil, about its history, about what it can be used for, about what kind of ecosystem it's supported. So when a soil is intact with its layers and so forth, um, it's a soil. When you dig that, when you dig up all those layers and make a pile someplace, so now the layers are all mixed up, there's nothing, you, you can't look at the soil and, and learn nearly as much about the history of the place. Now you have dirt. So uh, soils are in place. Uh, dirt is uh, missed, displaced soil, soils out of place. Well described and well visualized. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Excuse me. Soil or dirt, very nicely done. Um, we are going to uh, turn our attention uh, to a couple of quick resources just to follow up here. Don't forget, if you're new here, we wanted you to know that at shoutlearning.org there's a teacher's guide, which is a great one-stop shop for a lot of things related to Shout and how you can follow up with your classroom. And students and maybe other teachers, there's student challenges that you'll find there, including a challenge related to Pat's session about making a difference. And it ties back to soil and city planning and a variety of other related topics. So check out the student challenges and then share back with us. Tell us how it's going. Visit the Microsoft Partners in Learning Network website. We've got the link there and you'll also find it on shoutlearning.org. And check out the Taking a Global website. The link is here as well to have your students share back their work and what they're doing. And don't forget to visit us on Twitter and Facebook. We're Shout Learning on both sites. So thank you very much for liking us and following us accordingly. And please join me in thanking Pat McGonigal for his great walk through the soil today and helping us get excited. I'm ready. I'm hearing about people who want to do composting, who are ready to go do some digging. Uh, you certainly have inspired us, Pat, and we appreciate it very much. Speaking of inspiration, we're going to turn to your colleagues now, Jess Parker and Josh Falk, for a quick update on what's called the Smithsonian Tree Banding Project. And uh, as they jump in, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick poll questions on the screen. So. Go ahead and let us know what you know about the Smithsonian Tree Banding Project already. Gentlemen, how are you? Great. How are you doing, Jonathan? It's nice to be here. It's good to have you back. So what's the latest? So we are uh, getting very, very close to uh, getting tree bands on trees. Um, it's just exciting to listen into the, the past two presentations and you know, think about how they're connected to those two presentations. And you know, I think Pat even talked briefly um, how trees are greatly attached and rely on soil. Um, and then actually it's interesting how this project, the tree banding project, really um, it goes well with what Veronica was talking about with some of the global competency dimensions, talking about investigating the world. We're looking at trees around the world, uh, communicating ideas through the Shout Learning website. Students are going to be able to communicate those ideas. Uh, looking at different perspectives, you know, looking at how perspectives worldwide change about trees, um, and then taking action. And that's that's where this Shout Learning program comes in. And Josh, so, we, we have a number of people who are not familiar with the tree banding project. So maybe in a, in a nutshell, you could tell us what the project's about. And uh... Sure, I can definitely do that. Uh, Jess Parker, Dr. Jess Parker here at CERC, has been doing uh, forest research for 23 years. That's right. 23 years, um, looking at various aspects of forest ecology. One of them in particular is looking at how trees uh, respond to changes in climate. Uh, and started to do that on a more local scale. Uh, I wanted to really be able to study globally how trees uh, respond to those changes in climate. Uh, we don't have the resources or the, the manpower to get trees all over the world and measure them. And so we're involving students, teachers, learners worldwide in helping us me measure trees with a um, Stainless steel band goes around the tree, set of calipers, all of these things that measure very accurately how trees grow. Want to add anything to that, Jess? Or? Right, and we're trying to do this in such a way that um, <clears throat> we are learning about trees in all kinds of environments, really, in all places throughout the world. 
And the idea is that once the, the classrooms have their, their trees banded, they'll start making measurements on their trees. And um, with those measurements, uh, they'll uh, add them into a large database that we're creating, which will combine all the information from all the schools and all the, all the students. And with that database, we will be able to make um, uh, graphs and figures that show us how trees in general are growing. So we've got the, all the components here for a very interesting scientific study. Lots of observations, an organized way to, to combine them, and then a way to uh, learn something scientifically about the results. And so if you haven't signed up, uh, do sign up. What you need to do, and I don't have a slide showing exactly where it is right now, but if you go to www.shoutlearning.org um, and follow the links for tree banding or citizen science, either one, uh, citizen science being the idea of getting average citizens involved in real scientific research. If you click on any of those links, uh, it'll bring you to a page that will have a link on it that says uh, sign up for a tree banding kit here. And Jonathan, maybe as when, when you... Um, yep, we put a link in the chat box right there on the left, so oh. uh, anyone can click on that and head on over. Perfect. So if you haven't signed up, please sign up. Uh, currently, we have almost 100 schools that have signed up um, from all over the world, about 15 schools from Africa, about 10 schools from Asia, a couple schools from the Middle East, 10 schools from Europe, and then 26 different states in Washington, D.C., schools from the, the U.S. here um, as well. So we've got a, a good coverage. We want to we expand that coverage. You know, we've got about 100 kids already, already signed up for. We're aiming to get at least 500 out over the next several years to look at how uh, these uh, – trees are really responding to those changes in climate. And the first of these kits will be mailed out uh, sometime this week. Yep, the first ones are going to start going out tomorrow, and then we'll be mailing them out as we get the final parts uh, throughout the next week. So sign up now. You can get your kits soon. Um, and that database that Jess was talking about uh, will be live in several weeks, which works out well because once you get your kit, you need to actually wait several weeks for the tree to really adjust to um, to the tree band. Yeah, and so about halfway, I'm looking at the, the web page now, and about halfway down that web page is where the sign up is. But the tree banding page also has a video on why this is important, on how to tree band, um, how to select your trees, how to select your trees, um, some basic documents showing you uh, why, what, you, what, what else you need to do. Um, so that's sort of the update in a nutshell. If you've already signed up, you should be getting your kit very, very soon. Um, and uh, before we, we leave you, just a couple things to think about while you're waiting for, for your, uh, your kit to show up, just to get your mind sort of wrapped around trees. You know, start to get to know some of the trees in your, tree, in your schoolyard or around your school. Think about what trees you might be putting bands on. Think about the trees grow in certain places better than other trees. Uh, and if so, why? Um, if you want to get more involved, Take some photos of some of your trees. Uh, take a crayon and a piece of paper. Make a rubbing of bark. I know scientists even do that now to compare bark. Um, plus, it's you know, looking at art and science, how art and science interact with that first presentation this morning. It's a great connection to that also. And there, there will be a, a, a way on, on the Shout Learning website to post those photos or those images made. So Exactly. And then once you're signed up, you'll, like we alluded to before, join schools around the world and really a first, first ever global network in monitoring how trees uh, grow and respond to climate. Great. So, uh, Excellent. Well, we're excited to, uh, to see those uh, kits in action and uh, those trees uh, being monitored. And it's great to start to see those photos and the data coming back from around the world. So thanks to everyone who's already participating. And do check out the link that we've put in the chat on the left-hand side to request a kit if you're not already uh, part of this great citizen science project. So uh, thank you, Josh and Jess, for a great update. Um, we'll check in with you at our next session, which I should mention is coming up uh, in May. And I'm going to go ahead uh, and put uh, a little bit of some information about that next conference on your website, uh, on, on your screen, rather. It's May 18th. There's a, a link to register if you're not already registered. And you can share it around with your 
colleagues and friends. We've also posted all of the sessions that we'll, uh, you'll be able to look forward to in May. So check those out, and uh, we we'll look forward to having you. So on behalf of the entire Shout Learning team, we want to thank you all for being with us, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Shoutlearning.org, we'll see you there. Thanks, everyone.